Uh, I'm Mindy Chen Wishart and I'm the Dean of the Oxford Law Faculty. Uh, welcome to the Oxford Law Faculty's fourth annual Equality and Diversity Lecture. I want to say thank you all so much for coming. One upside of the pandemic is that we can host many of you and you can attend very conveniently. I want to signal the seriousness with which the law faculty treats equality, diversity and inclusion um, in the way that we deal with every aspect of what we do. This is now being led by a, our Associate Dean of Equality and Diversity, Kristen Van Zwieten, uh, who's only been in office for two terms, but who has very actively pushed forward uh, the law faculty's agenda. And she's being supported most ably by the Allen and Overy Equality and Diversity Officer, Clara Alode. We're learning and we're seeking to do better. The law faculty now has five fully funded um, DPhil scholarships for actually, uh, yes, five fully um, funded DPhil scholarships for UK based Black, Asian, minority ethnic applicants and one for Sub Saharan sub -Saharan African student. These were made possible by collaboration with um, the colleges. Uh, Merton, Magdalen, Christchurch, Oriel, Pembroke, and Brasenose. We are extremely grateful to those colleges. We're also, excitingly, in the process of setting up two fully funded scholarships for Black UK-based students doing the BCL with contributions from the commercial bar. Now, all of these scholarships are a recognition that the student body across the university is not as diverse as it should be and it represents an investment in the future um, uh, of academia and the legal profession. Now, one of our vice deans, Helen Scott, comes from South Africa. Taran Kaitan, our chair today, comes from India. I myself was born in Taiwan and at the age of 10 immigrated to New Zealand. We all, all of us came to Oxford courtesy of the Rhodes Trust. And I think this is an interesting nod to the connection between scholarships equality, diversity, and the pipeline. So to the fourth annual Equality and Diversity Lecture. This major public lecture aims to promote equality as a field of serious scholarly inquiry in the faculty and to give it a high profile. We're grateful to Blackstone Chambers for sponsoring the event. Now we all believe we are open-minded. No one thinks they discriminate that they are sexist, racist, ableist, homophobic, Islamophobic. Um, we all profess the importance of ED&I work. But what I've discovered is that um, we really don't need to, we really think that we don't need to change. We think we're okay. We don't expect to be made uncomfortable. Those opposed to change often say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But um, whether someone thinks that something is broke depends on who you ask. You'll get a different answer depending on whether you ask the slave owner or the slaves. The ax forgets what the tree remembers. So I urge you to listen with humility, without rationalizing, excusing, avoiding, defending, or gaslighting. Our first lecture, lecturer was Lady Brenda Hale, then president of the UK Supreme Court, who spoke about equality and human rights. Our second lecturer was Haben Germa, the first deafblind person to graduate from Harvard Law and who also happens to be black. Haben talked about disability accessibility. Our third lecturer was Professor Kendall Thomas, who spoke about critical race theory. Um, and this, the second and third lectures are online. Today, we invite Professor Tariq Madud. Uh, from the University of Bristol to deliver our annual Equality and Diversity Lecture on the topic of Islamic phobia and the struggle for recognition. And I now invite our own Professor Taran Khatan to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much, Dean, uh, for opening uh, our fourth Equality and Diversity Lecture. And it's my great honor to chair uh, this event um, in part because our uh, Associate Dean for Equality and Diversity, and the moving force behind this lecture, Professor Kristen Van uh, sadly cannot attend uh, only because she is currently in Sydney and the time zones uh, are punishing uh, 
despite her great desire to to to, to be here um, for this event. So, um, without further ado, um, I will introduce our very distinguished speaker uh, today. Uh, Tarek Madud is a professor of sociology, politics, and public policy, and the founding director of the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Citizenship at the University of Bristol, and the co-founder of the international journal Ethnicities. He was a Robert Schumann Fellow at the European Insti University Institute for a part of 2013 to 2015, a thinker in residence at the Royal Academy of Flanders, Brussels, in 2017, he served on the Commission on the Future of Multi-Ethnic Britain and the National Equality Panel and the Commission on Religion and Belief in British Public Life. He was made an MBE for services to social sciences and ethnic relations in 2001, a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences UK in 2004 and elected as a fellow of the British Academy in 2017. His latest books include Essays on Secularism and Multiculturalism, published in 2019. Multiculturalism, a civic idea, whose second edition came out in 2013. And he's also co-edited Multiculturalism and Interculturalism in 2016, and The Problem of Religious Diversity, European Problems, Asian Challenges in 20. 17. So I'm sure you'll agree with me that he is uh, an excellent speaker for us to, to listen to uh, in this lecture. You can find out more about him and his work on his website, tarekmadud.com. And please join me in welcoming our speaker for this lecture. Thank you. Over to you, Tarek. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mindy Chen Wishart and Professor Tarun Khaitan. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me. I'm aware of the honor you're bestowing on me to um, join this uh, series of lectures. And I hope I can do it some justice, your series some justice. So Islamophobia and the struggle for recognition. The Ranimee Trust launched the public career of the concept of Islamophobia in 1997. It was too much located in the field of religious tolerance and pluralism and an alternative understanding of Islamophobia that defines it as anti-Muslim racism in the context of multicultural citizenship um, was pioneered in sociology. This latter concept is establishing itself in social science and public discourse alike. Yet I have some misgivings of the direction that some Islamophobia and Muslim studies are taking. My approach sees racialized ethno-religious group identity as having an inside, but in much of social science, it is understood as something that is constructed from the outside, namely that it is an ascribed identity constructed as a form of othering. I think that both these aspects of groupness have a real world existence and political significance and cannot be reduced to the other. But too much social studies is focused on othering alone. One benefit of seeing that perceptions and criticisms of Muslims and Islam cannot be related, sorry, cannot be reduced to othering, is that it allows us to acknowledge that it is possible to reasonably criticize Muslims. I distinguish between Islamophobia and reasonable criticism of Muslims by emphasizing the importance of dialogue. Muslim intersubjectivity and agency, moreover, is particularly important for multicultural recognition and accommodation. So this lecture is a multiculturalist plea for studying Islamophobia 
and groups negatively perceived from the outside generally within a normative framework which prioritizes groups fighting outsider perceptions by boosting insider identifications. And that's what I mean by the struggle for recognition. The form of the discussion may be called normative sociology. Let us begin with racism. It was not very long ago that Anglophone scholars of racism understood it in terms of biology and specifically in terms of the black-white binary. At the same time, other scholars, especially in continental Europe, understood racism in terms of anti-Semitism, especially in the recent biologized forms that Europe has manifested. When it began to be clear that these two paradigms were failing to capture some contemporary experiences, such as anti-Asian cultural racism in Britain or anti-Arab cultural racism in France, some scholars began to move away from these paradigms. Yet, following the assertive Muslim agency triggered off by the novel, The Satanic Verses, and other Muslim controversies, as Muslims responded to such hostilities and articulated their misrecognition, they were constantly told that there is no such thing as anti-Muslim racism because Muslims are a religious group and not a race. Hence, Muslims could legitimately ask for toleration and religious pluralism, but not for inclusion in anti-racist egalitarian analyses and initiatives. While this view continues to be expressed even today, and some deny that there is a racism that, can, that could be labeled Islamophobia, it no longer has the hegemony it once had. While a number of Anglophone authors, including myself, started using the concept of Islamophobia in the late 1980s and early 1990s, it was the Runnymede Trust's Commission on British Muslims and Islamophobia and their report, Islamophobia, a Challenge for All, which launched the career of the term as a concept of public discourse in Britain and much beyond it. It presented Islamophobia as, I quote, a useful shorthand way of referring to dread or fear of Islam, and therefore to fear or dislike of all or most Muslims. End of quote. While the report was groundbreaking and played a crucial role in getting people to think about anti-Muslim prejudice, I felt its definition was back to front. Islamophobia was not fear of Muslims derived from a fear of Islam, but a hostility to and racialization of Muslims in the same way as anti-Semitism is anti-Jew racism, not a fear of Jews derived from a fear of Judaism. The Running Need Trust did not sufficiently locate Islamophobia as a racism. I continue to write about Islamophobia as a form of cultural racism, which may be built on racism based on physical appearance, for example, color racism, but was a form of racism in its own right, like anti-Semitism. This also became the approach of UNESCO and indeed of the 2017 Running Mead Trust report entitled Islamophobia, still a challenge for us all. It is at the center of the definition offered by the 2018 report of the all parliamentary group on British Muslims. That has been very widely accepted by most British political parties, by many local authorities and by the devolved governments of Scotland and Wales, but not by the Conservative Party and the UK government. 
So at this point, I'm going to share some slides. So hope this works. Yeah, so I hope, I hope that's working for you. Um, this is where I want to get to, yeah. There we go. So today I want to bring together five propositions. One, Islamophobia is a form of othering or cultural racism amongst other things. Two, a racialized group like Muslims cannot be reduced to a race or an other, nor to a religion. Three, critique of othering stroke Islamophobia presupposes non-othered knowledge of the other. That's a bit of a mouthful. I hope, I hope it'll make more sense as we go along. In fact, I should really move to the next slide for that. Yeah. Um, now, the fourth Critique of Islamophobia presupposes a normative framework, which of course then needs to be justified. And fifthly, Islamophobia can be distinguished from reasonable criticism of Islam and Muslims. So I'll go through them in that order. And so I'll begin with the first one. Islamophobia is a form of othering or cultural racism. Because while the perception and treatment of Muslims clearly has a religious and cultural dimension, it equally clearly bears a physical appearance or ancestral component. For while it is true that Muslim is not a biological category in the way that, say, Black or South Asian or Chinese is, neither once was Jew. In that instance, it took a long non-linear history of racialization to turn an ethno-religious group into a race. More precisely, the latter did not so much as replace the former, but superimposed itself because even though no one denied that Jews were a religious community with a distinctive language or languages, culture or cultures and religion, Jews still came to be seen as a race and with horrific consequences. Similarly, Bosnian Muslims were ethnically cleansed in the 1990s because they came to be identified as a racial group. That is to say, as having a perceived line of descent by people who otherwise were phenotypically, linguistically, and culturally the same as or similar to themselves. The ethnic cleanser, unlike an inquisitor, wasted no time in finding out what people believed, if and how often they went to a mosque and so on. Their victims were racially identified as Muslims in terms of membership based on a perceived line of descent. Race then, as I understand it, is not just about biology or even color. For while racialization has to pick on some features of a people related to perceived physical appearance and ancestry, otherwise racism cannot be distinguished from other forms of groupism, physical appearance need only be a marker and not necessarily denote a form of determinism. This is illustrated in the conceptualization of cultural racism as a two-step process. While biological racism is the antipathy, exclusion, and unequal treatment of people on the basis of their physical appearance or other imputed physical differences, saliently in Britain, their non-whiteness, cultural racism builds on biological racism a further discourse which evokes cultural differences from an alleged British or civilized norm to vilify, marginalize, or demand cultural assimilation from groups who may also suffer from biological racism. That's what I mean by the two-step 
understanding of racism or cultural racism. Post-war racism in Britain has been simultaneously culturalist and biological descent based. And while the latter is essential to the racism in question, it is, I think, in fact, the less explanatory aspect of a complex contemporary phenomenon. Biological interpretations have not governed what white British people, including racists, have thought or done, how they've stereotyped, treated, and related to non-whites. And biological ideas have had increasingly less force, both in the context of personal relationships and in the public conceptualization of groups. As white people's interactions with non-white individuals increased, they did not become necessarily less conscious of group differences, but they were far more likely to ascribe group differences to upbringing, customs, forms of socialization and self-identity than to biological heredity. I turn now then to the second proposition. A racialized group cannot be reduced to a race, nor a religious group to a religion. While understanding some contemporary treatment of Muslims and aspects of their societal status in terms of racialization clearly is an advance, we should beware that the conceptualization of Muslims in the West is not reduced to racialization or any other othering theoretical frame, such as Orientalism. By definition, othering sees a minority in terms of how a dominant group negatively and stereotypically imagines that minority as something other, as inferior or threatening, and to be excluded. Indeed, the dominant group typically projects its own fears and anxieties onto the minority. Minorities, however, are never merely projections of dominant groups, but have their own subjectivity and agency through which they challenge how they are misperceived and seek to not be defined by others, but to supplant negative and exclusionary stereotypes with positive and prideful identities. Oppressive misrecognitions thus sociologically imply and politically demand recognition, namely the opposite, the rectification of misrecognition. Our analyses, therefore, should be framed in terms of a struggle for recognition or multiculturalism, by which I mean a framework like the following. Multiculturalism marks a new conception of equality. Multiculturalism is not just anti-discrimination, the sameness of treatment and the toleration of difference, but also a respect for difference. This respect is not simply about equal rights, despite differences, but about equality as the accommodation of difference in the public space, which can be shared rather than dominated by the majority. It is in this sense that multiculturalism does not simply seek, say, freedom of conscience, non-othering, non-discrimination, or a religion neutral state. I think it has a more ambitious goal, which is on this slide. Namely, equal citizenship requires positive inclusivity through identity recognition and institutional accommodation, so that all can have a sense of belonging to the national citizenship without having to privatize ethnic or religious group identities important to them. Recognition, of course, does not mean thinking of Muslims as a group with uniform attributes or a single mindset, all having the same view on religion, personal morality, politics, 
the international world order, and so on. In this respect, Muslims are just like any other group. They cannot be understood in terms of a single essence. No one in the social sciences thinks that identities are based on cognitive or behavioral properties that are shared by all who may be members of a relevant group, such as women, black people, gay and lesbians, and so on. If group members then do not share a common essence, then they cannot be simply demarcated from non-group members because there will be many cases where individuals are not simply on one side of the boundary or the other. So groups cannot have discrete nor indeed fixed boundaries, as these boundaries may vary across time and place, across social contexts, and will be the subject of social construction and social change. And this view, I hope you recognize, um, those of you uh, who work in uh, social sciences, um, this view is often referred to as anti-essentialism. This anti-essentialism is rightly deployed in the study of Islamophobia and Muslims. It is a powerful way of handling ascriptive discourses, of showing that various popular or dominant ideas about Muslims, just as in the case of women, gays, and so on, are not true as such, but are aspects of socially constructed images that have been made to stick onto those groups of people because the ascribers are more powerful than the ascribed. Anti-essentialism is an intellectually compelling idea and a powerful resource in the cause of equality. However, it has more than one form. To pave the way for my third and fourth proposition, I want to briefly rehearse two interpretations of anti-essentialism, which I discussed in my book, Multiculturalism. The first is the skeptical interpretation that the critique kills the groups as real entities and they only live on as ascriptions or reactions to ascriptions or political make-believe. Rogers Brubaker, the em eminent American sociologist, for example, argues that, I quote, ethnicity, race, and nation are not things in the world, but perspectives on the world, ways of seeing, interpreting, and representing the social world, end of quote. Such skeptics do not necessarily want to kill off worthwhile political projects around, say, a black identity or feminism. And so some allow for something called strategic, essentialism, a term from Gayatri Spivak, where pretending that there is a black or national identity is permitted because of the politics. But analysts know that these identities are only, to use a term from Stuart Hall, necessary fictions. I think, however, and to the contrary, groups are not just strategically but conceptually necessary to both social science and to anti-racism or egalitarian politics. And so I offered an alternative interpretation of anti-essentialism. I suggested that Ludwig Wittgenstein's concept of family resemblance offers a way of recognizing that just as it does not make sense to say that games or languages do not exist, because they do not share a common definitional essence. So the lack of group essences and discrete bounded populations with unchanging characteristics was not a good reason to assert in an a priori way that groups did not exist. Rather, we had to have a more flexible, looser and variable notion of a group and of group membership that allowed 
for open textured and overlapping boundaries and overlapping memberships. If it seems difficult to reconcile this with our a priori concept of a group, let us call the entities groupings. The key point is that once we stop demanding that groups measure up to our impossible definitions, we would lose the temptation to conclude that groups suffered from an ontological deficiency, that they were merely, Rubaker's word, perspectives upon the world, ontologically no superior to the products of othering. Another way of putting it is that just as the complete self-made individual of some liberal theories does not exist, it does not follow that individuals do not exist, that we have to give up the idea of individual from social science vocabularies, so similarly with groups. Group identities are not just a multi, meaning there's, you know, a multiplicity of groups, are not just a multi, but groups can shift from, say, a race to a religion focus or fuse foci, for example, by combining ethnicity and religion. Religion itself is, of course, a multidimensional activity. For example, there is scripture, doctrine, worship, organization, codes of living, community, art, architecture, and so on. The multiculturalist interest is centered on an ethno-religious identity group that needs to be protected against racism and whose practices and symbols need to be accommodated in a respectful way in the public culture and institution of a country in which currently they're marginalized or not recognized as part of that country. A good example of such an ethno-religious group, which has been subject to racialization, are the Jews. Jews could be understood to be followers of a religion, Judaism. But follow here clearly cannot mean to believe in and strictly adhere to its rules. Many proud, self-defined Jews who are recognized as Jews by fellow Jews, as well as non-Jews, are atheists and or do not participate in approved collective worship and or do not follow the rules of living, such as keeping a kosher kitchen or covering their heads appropriately. Indeed, it is better perhaps to, it is perhaps better to think of Jews as a people with a religion, such that peoplehood and religion mutually inform each other, with religion a characteristic or a possession of a people, not of individuals per se. So while Jews would not be the people that they are without Judaism, not every individual Jew has to be religious in order to be a Jew. Moreover, there can be sources of Jewish identity other than those that are the strictly religious, such as the Holocaust as a memory of a people or a collective commitment to the state of Israel. I hasten to add, I'm talking of a socio-political understanding of Jews, including the self-understanding of many Jews, not an understanding internal to Judaism. I'm aware that different branches of Judaism have their own and differing criteria for defining who is a Jew, and that the differing criteria are a matter of great religious and, insofar as it pertains to the state of Israel, political dispute, both among different branches of Judaism and between them and non-religious Jews. As with Jews, so similarly with Muslims and Hindus and Sikhs, etc., albeit not discussed here. Various Islamic schools and sects have their own view on what is expected of a Muslim. And while they have some influence on how Muslims will decide who is and is not a fellow Muslim, as in the Jewish case, that is not decisive. 
Muslims also relate to each other as family members, as a community, as a political unity against Islamophobia or for justice for Palestinians, where non-religious Muslims, as long as they're not conspicuously anti-Islam, are taken to be Muslims. Muslims then are a people or ethnic groups with a religion, Islam, without any assumption that all individuals are religious or that the unity of the group is exclusively religious. In recognizing they're a group or a people, we do not need to assume an exaggerated unity, just as in talking of black people in Britain or as an Atlantic diaspora, we do not. Indeed, in thinking with my category, ethno-religious, we not only make explicit that we're talking about people, not simply doctrines or organized religion, these just being a feature of the people, as in my example of the Jews, and not exhaustive of the category. The important point is that processes of group identity formation can be from the outside in, that is to say racialization, or from the inside out, that is to say, an intersubjective sense of being an ethnic or ethno-religious group. So that now takes us to the third proposition. Critique of othering presupposes non-othered knowledge of the other. The value of othering as a way of studying minorities is that it can be used to challenge blanket generalizations about a minority. Othering sometimes takes the form of attributing certain features to a group, which are alleged to be found in all members of the group. All blacks are muggers, all Muslims are fanatics, and so on. Theorists of racialization typically add that even when no explicit biological ideology is in play, these general generalizations are being asserted by the racists in a quasi-naturalistic way. That is to say that like the laws of nature, they brook no exceptions. The problem with this is that it's an implausible analysis of racialized thinking. Racists often do admit of counterexamples. My best friend is black and no mugger. And if only all blacks could be like that, but alas, they're not. Moreover, these racialized statements, which identify groups on the basis of their physical appearance are not necessarily seeking biological or natural bases for the racialized generalization. The racializer is unlikely to believe that black mugging and Muslim fanaticism is genetic and much more likely to think that it's something to do with upbringing, family structure, community norms, etc. In short, what we might call culture in the manner of cultural racism that I described earlier. Yes, the concept of othering has the power to point out to racists that their generalizations do not hold of every member of the putative race, that their thinking suffers from quasi-naturalism or essentializes a group. However, all the racist has to do to escape the critique is to say that they're not talking about all members, but some members or many members or most members, or more precisely, of more members than is true for other groups or society as a whole. So to make effective the anti-racist critique, one needs to engage with probabilistic statements. And that means relating it to what is known or can be researched empirically about the population in question. More fundamentally, the question that my discussion here raises is, when a dominant group 
attributes certain characteristics to a subordinate group, how do we work out which of those characteristics that are meant to constitute the otherness of the minority is an imagined and malign projection onto the minority and which is a genuine feature of cultural difference. Another way of putting this is that the analysis of othering is not a self-sufficient intellectual perspective or disciplinary inquiry. You know, for example, as Orientalism or as anti-racism studies, it is dependent on an inquiry into the group as such and not just its othering. If we knew nothing about Muslims, we would have no way of knowing when they were being othered. Moreover, we could have no basis for refuting or limiting the power of stereotypes, racist generalizations, and other forms of othering. I'm reminded here of Dervla Murphy's wise words, of those whom we know nothing, we will believe anything. Of course, a group and its othering are sometimes not easily separated and certainly interact. My point is that a group may be and usually is more than just an other. For example, that the othered Muslim does not exhaust the possibilities of being a Muslim because it interacts with non-othered Muslimness. Moreover, while such alterations and cross influences will be happening all the time, we must not assume that they're all bad, all exercises of malign power, which means that we need a normative framework or at least a reference point to judge the benign from the malign exercises of power or social effects. This takes me to my next proposition. Critique of othering presupposes a normative framework which needs to be justified. Othering nearly always identifies the group in question in terms of negative features. Some of the most common are to do with having lower intelligence, less capable of disciplined, responsible behavior, and with a propensity for criminal or violent behavior. In relation to Muslims, some of the negative traits are an obsession with religion over other aspects of life, moral conservatism, especially in relation to sexuality, patriarchy, tendency to act on religion or politics in extreme and violent ways. Analysis of othering is clearly an important tool when it can be deployed to show the operation of these negative perceptions in the media, in news reports, in political discourses, and the way public concerns are raised and expressed, for example, in relation to what's called radicalization or women's dress, in television program content, in the activities of the security services, and so on. There is, however, a limitation to such analyses of othering or racialization, namely that sometimes there's a lack of agreement between those doing the othering and those being othered about whether certain features are necessarily negative. Most people will agree that to describe a group as less intelligent is to have said something negative about it. But is this the case with religious strictness and moral conservatism? Here it is possible that the dominant group may take one view of the matter, namely that such attitudes and behaviors are negative and backward, but the minority, that is to say substantial numbers in the minority, may refuse that such characterizations are negative. In recent years, we've seen this most starkly in Europe. 
in the dominant society's view that wearing the hijab or the burqa by Muslim women is a sign of oppression. Despite the dominant society delivering this judgment through the popular and intellectual media, the numbers of women engaged in such practices has increased and the increase has been accompanied by the women in question saying that they're choosing to don such clothes out of choice and not as compliance with the demands of Muslim men. To accept, to qualify or to resist such Muslim women's perspective is not just a matter of empirical inquiry, but invokes a normative framework. In, in recent years, aspects of feminism and liberalism, sometimes what's called Western feminism and muscular liberalism, have been cynically and insincerely used to critique and undermine various Muslim practices and claims for accommodation, including issues of women's dress. However, not all such appeals have to be cynical or insincere. They can be principled and reasonable. I'll say more about the sincere and insincere versions below in the next proposition. I'm at the moment simply making the point that some such normative framework is necessary. An analysis of othering, for example, how the fact of living within a hegemonic secularism subtly influences Muslim subjectivity is incomplete without an appeal to a normative framework. For without that, we cannot know to what extent the influence is a result of an exercise of self-interested power, of domination, and to what extent it is an aspect of benign social change on the part of Muslims themselves, who on a reasoned basis come to adapt their practices and modify their sense of what it means to be a Muslim. To stick with my earlier example, to argue that the hijab or the burqa are or are not a form of oppressive othering is not just a matter of empirical inquiry or discourse analysis, but implicitly or explicitly appeals to how to distinguish between what is negative and what is positive in the characterization of Muslims. If it is implicit, it needs to be made explicit. Either way, the normative presuppositions need to be questioned. That is to say, they cannot be taken for granted, but stand in need of argument and justification. Without such justification, not only may an analysis of othering be incomplete or distorted, but it may itself be an exercise in othering, namely in seeing groups in question as prejudicially othered, as for example, religious conservatives, when that is exactly how some of the group may wish to think of itself and to be respected for being as such. This will, of course, be an empirical matter. Hence my earlier point, the critiquing of othering presupposes empirical knowledge of the other. But depending on the facts, it may also be a refusal to accept the group on its own terms. That may not be wrong as such. My point is that to accept or not to accept will require a normative argument. And so a perspective such as Orientalism or anti-Islamophobia are incomplete without normative argument. So the kind of normative disavowal that one finds in the influential work of say, Bilal Assad is misplaced. He has been a powerful force for getting us to rethink secularism, but his conceptual framework does not explicitly help us to determine whether secularism is a good thing or which version of secularism is better than another? Or to put it another way, everyone will agree 
that Islamophobia must be distinguished from reasonable criticism of Muslims and aspects of Islam. But not only is this a difficult decision to make, but it begs the question, what are reasonable criticisms that Muslims and non-Muslims may make or discuss in relation to some Muslim views about, say, gender or education or secularism? Not only must the study of Islamophobia not squeeze out the possibility of such discussion, but by showing us where it becomes Islamophobic, it should help to guide us onto the terrain of reasonable dialogue. Merely identifying the unreasonable and the populist is not enough. Our frames of analysis should lead us to the reasonable, to what criticisms may be made of Muslims and or Islam, and what criticisms that Muslims want to make of contemporary Western societies, too, are worthy of hearing. The minority in question must be able to negotiate, modify, accept criticism, and change in its own way. A dialogue must be distinguished from a one-sided imposition. Islamophobia should therefore be studied within a normative framework, and not just one that exposes the normative presuppositions of others while evading the challenge of justifying one's own normative presupposition. My own framework, multiculturalism or a struggle for recognition and institutional accommodation prioritizes groups fighting negative outside of perception by giving normative and political weight to insider identifications in all their plurality. So I turn now to my last proposition. Islamophobia can be distinguished from reasonable criticism of Islam and Muslims. Yet how, it may be asked, are we to distinguish reasonable criticism from Islamophobia? Take the proposition. Muslim views about women are oppressive and not appropriate for modern Britain. Is this Islamophobia or reasonable criticism? In my evidence to the all-party parliamentary group on British Muslims, I proposed that we deploy five tests. Firstly, does it stereotype Muslims by assuming they all think the same? You know, does the criticism seem to suggest that all or most Muslims have this blameworthy characteristic and that this feature defines Muslims? indeed drowns out any unworthy, any worthy characteristics and ignores contextual factors. Secondly, is it about Muslims or is it a dialogue with Muslims which they would wish to join in? Does the mode of criticism consist of generalizing about a group in a way that tends to exclude them rather than treat them as conversational partners who share common concerns. Thirdly, is mutual learning possible? For example, one may criticize some Muslims for sexual conservatism or Puritanism, but is one willing to listen to those Muslims who think that contemporary societies like Britain are over-sexualized and encourage sexually predatory and undignified behavior. I mean, 10 years ago, a lot of people would have said, no, there's nothing to be learned here from Muslims whatsoever. But I think in the last few years, um, with the Me Too movement and a focus on um, uh, sexual predatory and undignified behavior, we're now in a different place where it seems that Muslims have something to say to the rest of society. So that's three tests. Then the last two tests, 
is the language civil and contextually appropriate or is it derogatory and offensive? Is the behavior or practice being criticized in an offensive way and seems to make Muslims the target rather than stick to an issue? For example, does a discussion of gender equality become a slurring of all Muslims? And finally, insincere criticism for ulterior motives. Does the person making the criticism really care about the issue? Or are they instead using it as a pretext to attack Muslims? And I've got an example here, I say, compare the conversion to feminism on, on the right. I mean, newspapers like the Daily Mail that say 25 years ago used to um, be uh, criticizing those who talked about gay rights and gay pride and so on, suddenly in the last few years have come to the view that alternative sexuality is essential to Britain, is what being British is all about. And it's a failure of conservative Muslims to appreciate this. That's what I mean by a criticism for ulterior motives. It's difficult to take such conversion as uh, simple sincerity. If the answers to questions one and five is a yes or a no to two, three, and four, then we may be dealing with Islamophobia. Any discourse can of course have a mixed character, but the more the answer aligns with the pattern mentioned, the more that discourse needs to be examined closely as to its potentially racist character. This of course is not a litmus test with a single decisive color result. I hope however, it indicates what we should be looking for and why and so can be the basis for a discussion about whether a particular discourse is racist or reasonable criticism. A thread running through these five questions, these five tests, is whether there's a potential, invited or uninvited, for dialogue. It is questions like these that should determine what others Muslims and what is capable of becoming a dialogue, albeit a critical dialogue with Muslims. So that's my five propositions. And here's a few words in conclusion. The public career of the concept of Islamophobia was launched by the Running Me Trust in 1997. I've offered an alternative understanding of Islamophobia that does not locate it in the field of religious tolerance and pluralism, rather as anti-Muslim racism in the context of multicultural citizenship. This concept is becoming established in social science and public discourse. I have, however, expressed some misgivings of an aspect of the direction that some Islamophobia and Muslim studies are taking. Racialized ethno-religious groups have an insight, but in much of social science are understood as constructed from the outside or as a form of othering. Both these aspects of groupness have a real world existence and political significance and cannot be reduced to each other. Inquiries focused on othering alone are therefore one-sided and incomplete. They may be motivated by an urgent anti-racism, but may, by leaving aside Muslim subjectivity and agency, they may in the long run diminish the status of Muslims. Moreover, by appreciating that perceptions and criticisms of Muslims and Islam cannot be reduced to othering, is that it allows us to acknowledge that criticizing Muslims is not intrinsically unreasonable or racist. I have distinguished between Islamophobia and reasonable criticism of Muslims by emphasizing the importance of dialogue. 
if this use of multiculturalist concepts of cultural racism, identity recognition and dialogue can help us to grasp the core and limits of the concept of Islamophobia, it might be an indication that multiculturalism is not dead, but has a vital contribution to make on contemporary problems around diversity. This lecture is thus a multiculturalist plea for studying Islamophobia and groups negatively perceived from the outside generally within a normative framework based on the importance of boosting insider identifications for groups fighting outsider perceptions. My aim has been to simultaneously present a distinctively multiculturalist approach to understanding and responding to Islamophobia, and I think modesty, modestly illustrating a way of doing sociology, a way which I call normative sociology. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing the screen. Professor Madhud, that was a learned, insightful and nuanced uh, presentation from which I learned a lot. Um, I think the way in which you present an internal and limiting critique of the contours of Islamophobia and the intellectually extremely generous take on the other side, as it were, in this case, who might be Islamophobes, um, for me had all the hallmarks of one might uh, characterize as scholarly uh, in the best sense of the term. Um, I, I personally really appreciated uh, the, uh, the call for dialogue and the use of the potential for dialogue as, as a key distinguishing mark. Um, in, in eschewing uh, the authenticity demands for making criticisms that we see so pervasively in our public culture today. Um, and, and, and you know, your, your notion of groupings uh, was fascinating and I was reminded of a parallel with corporations rejecting unionism by citing individual differences between employees. Um, and you know, I, I've never thought of this before, but anti-essentialism uh, can and perhaps has become a tool to target that uh, Cinderella of the French Revolution, you know, fraternity or solidarity. And so, um, so charting that course between uh, essential essentialism, but also rejecting uh, essentialism and, and the existence of groups was fascinating. So, um, thank you, thank you for a very insightful and nuanced talk. The floor is open. Uh, I'm already getting a lot of questions, and I will um, moderate and pose. Uh, uh, a, some of them or collection of them uh, to, uh, to Professor Madhud. Um, so the first one, Professor Madhud, is, um, is a question about, that invites you to think about Islamophobia um, uh, in a context other than the UK. Uh, and, the, and the person asking the question wants to know, how can we locate Islamophobia in a context like India where, um, Perhaps it's, it's a racialized multicultural context, uh, but other than the religion itself, um, the racial identity of, of, uh, of say Hindus and Muslims in most uh, contexts will be the same. So uh, do we think about racialization of Muslims in a context like India differently from, from the UK? Yes, um, thank you for your um, kind remarks, Darren. And as for the question, yeah, it, 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 is, it is interesting. I, I have thought about it, especially in the last few years when I would say we have such rampant Islamophobia in um, India, encouraged from the top and from, um, you know, and it takes a very organized form as well. And in many ways goes way beyond what is happening in um, Britain and Europe. Um, so I guess the problem some people might say is, well, whatever is happening in Britain, you can't call it um, Islamophobia because actually it's nothing to do with races because um, biologically, phenotypically, Muslims 
and Hindus and Sikhs in the Punjab may all be the same. Muslims, Hindus and Sikhs in Bengal may all be the same. So therefore, the issue is to do with religious difference and not cultural racism. I'm not convinced by that argument. Um, think about Bosnia that I, I mentioned just in passing. So in the uh, early 1990s, as we all know, when this Yugoslavia started breaking up, the people that had been living together, speaking the same language, um, and being actually physically, uh, you know, phenotypically indistinguishable from each other, you know, they were Slavs, um, uh, sharing a common culture in many, many respects, um, and a shared history, shared history um, similar, though not completely identical, uh, reference points, cultural and historical reference points. Um, some people decided, let's say some Serbians or Serbian Bosnians or their leaders or whatever decided that a group called Muslims could no longer uh, peacefully inhabit particular territories because they were to be uh, annexed out of Bosnia and to become either independent or to join Serbia. And so those people had to be uh, removed, expelled, or, or of course killed as many of them were. Um, and, and we call that phenomenon, we called it at the time, ethnic cleansing. So we didn't use the word race or racialization, but I hope it's clear from my lecture that I would call it that the Bosnian Muslims were racialized and they were racialized in terms of descent. And I said that nobody asked anybody, no Serbian asked any Bosnian Muslim, what do you believe? You know, um, how often do you go to the mosque? Do you fast? So people were identified as Muslims on the basis of community belonging or a perceived line of descent. And isn't that the same in India? The people who may be attacked in a particular neighborhood and told they should no longer live in that neighborhood or just have their uh, shops and homes burnt or whatever. There isn't a question about religiosity. You know, what do you believe? It's a question of you are Muslims because of your community affiliation or your perceived line of descent. So that's what I'm calling racialization. So I would say that in India at the moment, we are seeing a very acute form of Islamophobia. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Madhu. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask you a loyally question. And uh, you know, this, if this is unfair, please decline to answer. Uh, but I'm really interested in your sociological take uh, on it. Um, in, in most bills of rights that our courts enforce around the world, um, religion tends to uh, appear twice. Um, it appears uh, as part of a right to religious freedom, which is usually uh, freedom of religion, conscience, and belief. Um, and it appears uh, as part of a, an anti-discrimination right. Uh, on multiple grounds, including sex, sexual orientation, race, and one of them tends to be religion. Um, and I'm just curious about your own views on, on what are the implications, if any, um, of how lawyers should think about these two human rights differently based on uh, your claim that Muslims uh, and indeed many other groups uh, cannot be reduced uh, either to a race or to a religion uh, exclusively. Yeah. Well, the first thing I, I would say, uh, Tharu, is so you've identified two legal dimensions of religion, freedom of belief or conscience, and if you like, freedom from discrimination and discrimination. Um, but religion has, far many more dimensions than that, and, and they are legally regulated. So uh, religions 
um, have the right to organize in certain kinds of ways. They have charitable status. Um, people can take uh, time off. Um, well, I suppose that might fall under uh, freedom of fr freedom of conscience. On, but also, um, people's sense of belonging to a country, to a national identity, and so on, is uh, can be. It doesn't have to be, but it can be related to a religion or some religions. And of course, the example we were just talking about a moment ago, India, is highly pertinent here. Um, because the argument is uh, by the anti-Muslims that Muslims are not true Indians because they believe in a foreign creed or they are loyal to another state, namely Pakistan and so on. So, so, so the, the, there are a lot more aspects to the legal regulation of religion and what I call institutional accommodation than just the rights that you raised. And you, you mentioned them as two aspects of human rights. But of course, I'm going way beyond human rights. You couldn't defend multiculturalism just on the basis of human rights. Multiculturalism is a ambitious political ideal. And I, I know some people, of course, have a similar reading of human rights as a very sick um, uh, political project. I personally don't. I think uh, human rights are more modest than that. And it's, if you like, our citizenship rights that do most of the work of what we call equality. So to, to take a simple example, the right to, um, for a religious group to run a school and beyond that, to have that school funded out of uh, the taxpayers' resources. Now, those two rights, I don't think they're human rights. To argue for them would be to argue for, well, what might citizens do in this country? And if they're not allowed to do it, why, why is that the case? Or why is it that some religious organizations are allowed to run their own schools and or have them publicly funded and others are not. And while that might come to an issue of discrimination, which is something you are raising, it actually is not a discrimination against individuals. It's a discrimination against organized entities, organized religion, like you know churches and, and uh, similar kinds of organizations. So I think that, um, it really requires a, uh, a legal system or a, uh, regulations that go beyond human rights. So human rights can play a very critical role, above all, uh, where they seem to be absent or deficient. But I was arguing very strongly that multiculturalism has to go beyond a negative goal of anti-othering or of anti-anything, anti-racism, uh, anti-discrimination. So the multiculturalism I was arguing for was this positive idea of equal citizenship, not a negative idea of anti-discrimination. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Madhud. Uh, the next question, I'm going to uh, combine a couple of questions that have been asked. Um, and, and the thrust of all these questions um, seek to invite your views on, on the definition of Islamophobia. Um, and uh, so one of them uh, is interested in, in your take on the all party parliamentary groups definition of Islamophobia, which uh, for the benefit of the audiences, I've just Googled this and I hope that I've got the right definition when I'm posting it in the chat. Um, so, so this is what I have found from a quick Google search is the thrust of the, but I'm sure you will correct me for some if I'm wrong. And I believe that a different question is also um, asked with the same um, spin, uh, I think, which is, um, is Islamophobia just uh, a wrong 
phrase to you. So would something like anti-Muslim hatred um, have better captured? I, I know that sometimes terms gather currency and then acquire a stickiness and you have to go with them. But, um, but does Islamophobia fail to capture what the phenomenon uh, as well as it might have and, and, and maybe replacing it with something like anti-Muslim hatred or discrimination uh, be better? Yeah, thank, thank you, Tarun. So um, let's begin with the second. Um, is there something inappropriate about the term Islamophobia? Well, it, it's not a very satisfactory term, really. Uh, but I have to confess that most terms that we use are pretty unsatisfactory. I mean, I'm kind of, you know, beating my chest and saying I'm a multiculturalist, I'm presenting a multiculturalist argument. But in many ways, multiculturalism is not a, a satisfactory term either, because it begs questions about what exactly is culture. People often interpret the multi to mean um, coexistence, which is exactly the opposite of what I'm arguing for when I'm talking about uh, inclusivity into a uh, equal citizenship. So we do have to use the language that we have. Obviously, we try and improve it. So in the early days, when I was working on, on these topics, um, say the early 1990s, I tried not to use any one term. So I would speak of, for instance, of anti-Muslim racism or anti-Muslim discrimination or Muslimophobia and so on. But I could see that there was a tide building up that was using the term Islamophobia amongst Muslim activists and that this was beginning to catch on with other activists perhaps and in, um, in uh, uh, social sciences. So I just thought to myself, what is the value of me trying to have another term to more or less achieve the same result? Isn't it better to play a more uh, contributory and collaborative role? Because I'm willing to use certain terms like multiculturalism, integration is another word, as well as Islamophobia as long as I can play some role in defining them. So I tend to use them in distinctive ways, which connect with, but aren't the same as how others may wish to use them. And I, I can see the danger of that because people get confused. Often when I say, you know, I'm talking about multiculturalism, people look at me and say, what? But multiculturalism is about segregation. I say, no, it's not. I mean, who, who says it is? No multiculturalist says it is. So it's only the anti-multiculturalists who are defining multiculturalism as segre segregation. Would we, would we let anti-feminists define feminism? So I'm willing to use uh, terms of common discourse as long as I can also uh, give them my kind of reasoned uh, content and nuance. And this is exactly what I've tried to do with uh, Islamophobia. And as I kind of pointed out, when the term became a quite a, a prominent term as a result of the Runnymede Trust 1997 report, um, they talked about the fear and dread of Islam and therefore of Muslims. And I think it's just the other way around. It's a racialization of Muslims and Islam comes in as something that belongs to Muslims. Um, so I, if you like, I used their term, but wanted to repackage it, um, not arbitrarily, you know, on the basis of reasoned argument. And I like to think that I've been influential. There's quite a lot of us now anyway, who think like that. And the APPG, that's to say the All Par Parliamentary Group on British Muslims, went in, the, in that direction, and UNESCO and Runnymede itself has gone in that direction. I moved from a focus of, from anti-Islam or fear of Islam, you know, phobia about Islam, to anti-Muslim racism, but using the same term, 
And it is sometimes said that it's part of the British genius to have institutional reform while keeping the same term. This is true of our monarchy, the House of Lords. We've kept that title, but of course, the House of Lords today is very different from what it has been throughout most of its history. It's not simply a, uh, a hereditary aristocratic uh, body and so on. So I, rather than invent new terms, I prefer to contest existing terms. And if Islamophobia can be defined in the way that I'm suggesting, then I'll be happy with the term, even though the Islam part for me isn't primary and the phobia part for me isn't um, really the right term either. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Madhud. I believe we might have just enough time to squeeze in one final question. Um, and so j just as anti-essentialism um, is, is such an important uh, buzzword in, 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 in identity politics literature, uh, so is intersectionality. Um, and, and I'm just curious about the implications of, of your very thoughtful take on Islamophobia for both the scholarship and the practice of intersectionality. So, you know, I get the intra-group um, idea of groupings that, that you talked about, but how does that translate to, to intergroup relations? And can we, can we think about, you know, moving away from a politics of competitive disadvantage uh, between minority groups towards a politics of, uh, I don't know, a, a fellowship of the disadvantaged. Right? So, um, and, and there were there were some hints you dropped quite tantalizingly about overlaps, uh, et cetera. So I'm just inviting you to perhaps expand yeah. upon them. Yeah, okay. There are actually several questions there and we may not have time to totally unpack them, but I'll certainly address one or two points. So I do, uh, read and think about intersectionality and consider to myself, for myself, is it a helpful framework for my own thinking? Should I try and relate to it? In fact, I'm often encouraged to do so by some other people. And I just can't get too enthusiastic about it, partly because I feel I'm developing my own way of linking certain kinds of collective identities. So race, ethnicity, religion, citizenship, national identity. So, and I think that this is exactly what multiculturalism is about. So you might say, well, that's a redefinition of multiculturalism, but anyway, it's what my understanding of multiculturalism is about. So for a start, intersectionality does not work with most of those collective identities. Uh, people who work on intersectionality, I mean, it started, of course, with race, meaning color racism and gender and particular forms of feminism. So if you like, they started in one place, I started in another place, and maybe we might find some ground in the middle um, but it hasn't happened yet. But when I think to myself, well, should I be, you know, tapping into that framework? Because obviously it's quite a, quite a large um, body of people now who are working with it and so on. I feel, well, they sideline my interests, so maybe they're not that bothered. So um, perhaps that's not a completely intellectually satisfying answer, but anyway, it, it, does, it does express some of my... Uh, frustrations um, and the another part of what you were saying was about the inter so uh, and, and if you like a kind of uh, fellowship of minorities rather than competitive disadvantage I really do have some problems here because um, some people say for instance there should be no hierarchy of racisms or hierarchy of oppressions. And I just think, well, why not? Why shouldn't there be any? 
So if you mean there isn't any natural hierarchy, that is to say an a priori hierarchy, well, I entirely agree with that, yes. Okay, but as you can tell from my lecture, my lecture insists that we have to uh, relate our work, our understanding of Islamophobia to empirical inquiry, not a priori deductions, but empirical inquiry within a normative framework. And when you do that, surely you see that in certain times and places, certain racisms are more virulent than others, and certain kinds of racisms are uh, less, are getting less attention from um, the public, from you know, the political class, from uh, lawyers, and so on. And so therefore, you might want to say the prioritization in terms of law and policy and action and programs should match the extent and intensity of the racism that exists at any one time. And of course, this can change. And I feel at the moment that is not the case. I think that if we look at any data that measures these things, we find that hostility against Muslims in Britain and in Western Europe is more or less double. That's roughly a figure one finds across a number of studies, more or less double what it is against other minorities, let's say black people or Asian people or Chinese people in um, France or Turks in Germany and so on. Um, and therefore, I think, well, obviously that becomes a priority, but actually it has far less a priority in our politics, uh, not just Britain, but the other countries that I mentioned as well. So the hierarchy that I believe in is the hierarchy of action, hierarchy of urgency. It's, it surely can't be true that all racisms and oppressions are of equal magnitude in all times and places, and therefore all require the same degree of priority. So now, but there must be political cooperation and alliance. No, no single minority will achieve very much if it just ignores everybody else and tries to create its own agenda. Um, so I certainly believe in alliance uh, building and uh, alliance campaigning across bodies and not just minorities. I mean, you need to have the majority. You need to build a public consensus. And if we look at the whatever kinds of change we've achieved in Britain, or I would say the United States or whatever other country we looked at, it's only when a minority is able to persuade people beyond itself and beyond the rainbow coalition of minorities is able to shift the public consensus, the mainstream consensus, that action follows. So I certainly believe in a pragmatic politics of alliance and consensus uh, shaping, consensus, consensus changing. But that doesn't mean that all minorities' um, agendas are of equal importance in all times and places. Thank you for the thoughtful response, Professor Madhud. And with that, I hand over to the Dean. Well, um, thank, thank you to everyone who's uh, come. And I, I think you've been richly rewarded. Uh, we've been uh, informed as to the urgency of the topic, the importance of the topic, the importance of dialogue, and that uh, we, we've been given a very balanced approach, I think that whilst uh, we have to be extremely concerned about Islamophobia, at the same time, Islam is not beyond criticism and he gives us an extremely helpful and practical uh, five uh, step test. So I think I want to thank Professor Madhud on behalf of all of us uh, for such a learned talk uh, and for showing us how complex the subject is and how learned and serious he has been and is about the subject. So thank you very much. And with that, I close this lecture. Thank you too.